Well, hey, North Langley, uh, welcome back to our series, Shalom, Following Jesus in an Angry, Anxious, and Polarized World. I want to begin just with some personal remarks. Thank you so much to all of you who've been praying for my family uh, in Alberta, uh, Tanya's side of the family, as Tanya has lost her father. And I just really appreciate, uh, I haven't been able to thank everyone for your kind words and for your prayers. Thank you so much. Uh, if, if you want to pray, uh, keep praying for my, my mother-in-law. Uh, her name is Elvira, as she processes uh, the beginning of life without, without dad. And uh, for my wife, Tanya, and for her siblings, um, as the grief begins to really set in, we would appreciate your prayers. But thank you so much for all, the, all of you who have encouraged us during this uh, difficult season. Thank you. I also want to thank Pastor Tim. Thank you so much for, <clears throat> for, for your sermon, uh, Tim, on being a non-anxious presence last week. It was really helpful as he began maybe like a two-week mini-series here in, in listening, uh, a mini-series within a series, of listening to our emotions. And that's what we're going to do today. Today is part two in, in what it means to be aware of our emotions as we follow Jesus in a polarized age. I really love my younger brother, Nathan. Uh, he and I love each other deeply. It's just the two of us. Uh, we, we're uh, just uh, the two of us in the family. Um, and... He's one of my favorite people in the whole world. We, we love to debate, my brother and I. We, we love to have uh, 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 deep conversations. And so uh, whenever I'm in Oklahoma or whenever he, he travels up here, um, we end up getting into these debates. And debate really runs deep into the, uh, the genes, the Price family uh, DNA. Uh, it goes back generations. I remember my, my father and grandfather uh, and my uncle in deep conversations for many years in the living room. Uh, but as, as our polarized age has continued to become more polarized, my brother and I have found ourselves on opposite sides of, of, of a few uh, key issues. And once uh, he and I were, were having a conversation about abortion, and uh, pro-life, pro-choice, and, and uh, as someone who is a pro-life myself, I accused my brother, um, and I used a tactic against his pro-choice views that was not the best. I accused him of advocating for the practice of eugenics. Eugenics, uh, that it was used in the Third Reich during World War II, to which he had to reply to his older brother, Matthew, I'm not a Nazi. Matthew, I'm not a Nazi. What was I doing? You're pro-choice? You're a Nazi. Here's the deal. If I'm accusing my brother of being a Nazi, that's a conversation stopper. I think you would all agree, right? It's a conversation stopper. That conversation is going nowhere quickly, very quickly. Have you ever had a conversation like that? That kind of attack reminds me of the film War Games. Growing up, one of my favorite films was War Games, starring Matthew Broderick. Uh, David Lightman is this kid who's a, who's a computer whiz from Seattle. And, and David taps into a computer network that triggle, triggers actual nuclear weapons in Russia to fire on North America. It's a, it's a fun movie. Um, David uh, ends up at NORAD, that bunker in Colorado, and he's working with this professor, Professor Falcon, who invented the computer. And he's trying to get the computer to not launch the nuclear warheads. And so he's trying to teach the computer to, to learn a lesson. And in a moment of genius, he, he teaches the computer to learn the game tic-tac-toe and to play tic-tac-toe against itself, which, as we all know, is futile, right? You can't win if you're playing tic-tac-toe against yourself unless half of you is smarter than the other half of you, which I don't know if that makes sense. The computer begins to play tic-tac-toe and learns the concept of a no-win scenario. You can't win when you're playing tic-tac-toe against yourself. And you can't win in the game of nuclear war. And so the, the computer ends up learning the concept of, quote, mutual assured destruction. Mutual assured destruction. And, and the computer gives this greeting to Professor Falcon. Greetings, Professor Falcon. Hello. A strange game. The only winning move is not to play. How about a nice game of chess? <laughs> so, to spoil the ending, no missiles are launched, the world is saved, Matthew Broderick is a hero, again. Now, Nathan, my brother, whom I love, when I think about my conversation with him, I was playing a nuclear war game. 
mutual assured destruction. And I wonder, is there a better way? How do we move away from war game conversations that always lead to a mutual assured destruction in our relationships? Whether we're talking about race, a pandemic, sexuality, human rights, the economy, whatever it is, is there a better way? Well, today I want to make a case for gentleness. Gentleness. The gentleness of Jesus. I think it's one of the most forgotten virtues and fruits of the Holy Spirit. So today, as we move away from culture wars and follow the way of Jesus, let's begin by listening to his great invitation to us. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Jesus, you have been so gentle with me, even in my rebellion. Would you reveal your gentle strength to our church today, that we would become a people of gentleness as we follow you, our gentle and strong Savior. Amen. All right, North Angley, how do we cultivate gentleness in an age of outrage? I'm paraphrasing Scott Swain, president of the Reformed Theological Seminary. How do we cultivate gentleness in an age of outrage? In Galatians chapter 5, in the New Testament, Paul is encouraging the church to walk by the Spirit. He's clear that there are two ways to live your life. You can be led by the Spirit or by the flesh. Those are your two options. In our angry, anxious, and polarized age, to be led by the flesh looks like this. Look at verses 19 to 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. To be honest with you, these words are the words in that passage that we would typically jump over. Am I right? Typically, we as pastors, to throw all of us pastors under the bus, we would generally go to those verses to highlight things like sexual immorality and drunkenness and maybe envy, maybe, if we're doing like a series on money or something like that. But not these words. I've never focused on these words. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. By the way, if some of you are reading the New Living Translation, the NLT, the word factions is translated in this amazing way. It's translated with a whole sentence. It's translated, the feeling that everyone is wrong except your little group. <laughs> I love that. The feeling that everyone is wrong except your little group. You see, my flesh wants to hate. My flesh is jealous and selfish. My flesh likes dissension. I mean, maybe I wouldn't admit it, but I, I, I kind of like dissension. I like being in a group. I like factions and argumentativeness. My flesh loves, quote, the feeling that everyone is wrong except my little group. These things are way more satisfying. It's way more satisfying to have one of those gotcha moments in a conversation. We daydream about revenge, but we never daydream about our next chance to be gentle in a conversation. Maybe you do. I don't. All my daydreaming is about how I'm going to have that gotcha moment. Back to Galatians 5. As followers of Jesus, we're called to walk by the Spirit, and the Spirit is the one who will grow the fruit of gentleness in our life. Listen to this, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
Now, if you're new to Jesus, I know some of you have been streaming our, our services and you're brand new to Jesus. Look at this incredible offer that Jesus makes in our life. This is what he's promising to give us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises that when we follow him, if we truly follow him, he promises to make us gentle. Isn't that beautiful? And the gentleness of Jesus is everywhere in the New Testament, by the way. This is not some small teaching tucked away in some corner, a teaching that, you know, doesn't really deserve an entire sermon. It's like an entire sermon on gentleness. Not at all. Listen to gentleness throughout the New Testament. Matthew 5, blessed are the gentle. We, it's always translated meek, but it, it's the same word in Greek. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Ephesians 4, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Philippians 4, let your gentleness be evident to all. Colossians 3, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. James 3, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. North Langley, gentleness is everywhere in the New Testament. This has been one of the recent discoveries for me in the last year. Uh, I was reading a book by Dallas Willard called The Allure of Gentleness, and I was like, it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. But one of the most important places we find gentleness is in the only verse, catch this, the only verse where Jesus describes his own heart to us. It's beautiful. There's one place in the entire New Testament where Jesus says, this is what my heart looks like. And we've already read the verse, but let's read it again. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Here it is. For I am gentle and humble in heart. I'm gentle, says Jesus. Jesus is like, if you go down deep into my heart, if you want to know my heart at the core of who I am, I'm gentle and humble. How beautiful, hey? In our angry, anxious, and polarized age, we are welcomed by Jesus to come know that heart. And he's welcoming you into that heart today. He looks at you, and he says, come know my heart. Know my gentle heart. All right, what does it mean to be gentle? Is gentleness living as a doormat? Is gentleness never standing for truth? No. Let me, let me quote Scott Swain again. Gentleness is the virtue that tempers our anger, wrath, and desire for vengeance when we suffer or witness injustice. I think this is brilliant. He says this, gentleness is the moderation, not the absence of anger. Gentleness is the virtuous middle road, the mean, between prideful anger, which is anger in excess, and lazy apathy, which is anger in defect. I love this definition. Scott Swain is arguing that gentleness does involve conviction. So I'm sure already in the sermon you were wondering, <laughs> does this mean we like don't care about truth or we don't care about our convictions? Not at all. We have witnessed in our life what we believe to be injustice and we're angry or we're passionate and we want to stand for truth and we, we've got strong opinions. That's okay. That's good. You should search for truth and and, and form your opinions, and you have conviction. It's all good. But what we do when we interact with others is we refuse prideful anger on the one hand and lazy apathy on the other. And I'm just going to switch microphones. All right. Hope this is a little bit better. So back to my definition. So we, we won't be controlled by prideful anger on the one hand and we won't resort to lazy apathy on the other. So here's what the follower of Jesus does. The follower of Jesus walks the middle road, and I want to call that today gentle conviction. Gentle conviction. To be gentle is to live with the courage of Christ. Look at Jesus. He was courageous with the truth. I want you to know today, this is not some campaign to like create tons of Ned Flanders like in the church. That's not it. Because gentleness is strength. Why? Because to be gentle is to take the anger, the frustration, 
the truth and the conviction we have about like really important issues and channel it all, catch me here, channel it all into the good of the other. Channel all of that truth and conviction for the good of the other. Gentle conviction is the desire to help another. It's the helping ministry. We want them to hear the truth, not in a patronizing way, but actually because we love them. We don't just, yeah, yeah, I love you. Let me tell you the truth. No, it's actually, I, I, I love you. I care about you. Listen to 1 Peter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. My whole life, I've heard the first part of that verse, right? <laughs> Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason, but do it with gentleness. Why is that so important? It's important because the medium is the message. This is a phrase that many of us learned in Communication 101, right? Uh, coined by the Canadian communication theorist Marshall McLuhan. The medium is the message. His point is that we have to think critically, not just about the message, but how the message is communicated. How the message is communicated is massive. It's so important. How we communicate the message is the message. If I scream at you that God loves you, you're not going to be hearing love. If I'm conveying true information, but at the same time trying to control you and trying to control the words you use and your speech, you're not going to hear truth. You're going to feel controlled. Dallas Willard, in his book, The Allure of Gentleness, makes the point that if anyone is ever going to encounter Jesus in us, Jesus, the one who's gentle and humble in heart, then we have to embody that message. No one will ever be pointed to Jesus who is gentle and humble in heart if I don't myself embody that message of gentleness and humility. The medium is the message. Very few, let me say this, very few will be able to divorce our truth from our tone. Very few. I've never been able to do that when someone's talking to me. It's, it's very hard to be able to divorce the, the, the truth from our tone. You see, I can't change people. But if I come with gentleness, I give the greatest opportunity for someone to hear what I'm trying to say to them because they experience in my life the gentleness of Jesus. Again, I'm not changing them. There is no way I can change someone else's mind. But they have, they have an opportunity. There's like, there's a, a spaciousness there. It's like, oh, that you give them the best shot at hearing the message. It gives room for the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is serious. Jim Simbola, pastor of New York, says this. He says, cocaine, alcohol, and sexual temptation have slain their thousands, but bickering, quarreling, and criticism in the church have slain their ten thousands. I want to make this clear. Our cities and neighborhoods and families will not be able to hear the good news of Jesus because of the lack of gentleness they find in the church. Right now, could you just pause and bring to mind the relationship in your life that has suffered because of a lack of gentleness? I think the Holy Spirit, it's his delight to bring to mind some of these relationships. What conversation comes to mind? You and someone else were engaged in a war game that led to mutual assured destruction. They think they're still right. You think you're still right. But it's brought devastation to your relationship. What relationship has suffered the most? Halfway through the sermon, I just want to pause and, and pray. King Jesus, we lift up these these moments, these conversations, these relationships to you right here. And King Jesus, we would ask that you would shape us in the coming days to be gentle. Jesus, right now, many of us are thinking of some of those painful moments, and we're asking that you would heal us, that you'd bring reconciliation to our relationships, and that you would give us the strength to walk in humility 
and to apologize. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, now, for the second half here, what I want to do is I want to get practical. How do we cultivate gentleness in an age of outrage? I want to offer four quick points here about how to cultivate gentleness in our life. I hope you find these are helpful. Okay, point number one, to live with a gentle conviction is to walk with humility. You probably could have seen that one coming. Uh, To live with a gentle conviction is to walk with humility. Jesus encourages us in his teachings that before you try to change someone and point out their faults, in his words, before you try to remove the speck in your brother's eye, that you should probably remove the plank out of your own eye. Uh, Humility is to acknowledge that I usually walk around in my life with a two-by-four stuck out of my eyeball. And I cannot see. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, you can't see. you got this thing in your eye. And so why don't you try removing that first before you help with the little bit of sawdust in your brother's eye? See, I'm always more messed up than I think. I'm usually more confused than I think. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. It's a little bit of a longer quote, but it's hilarious, and I like it. God sees how all the people in your home or your job are in various degrees awkward or difficult. But when he looks into that home or factory or office, he sees one more person of the same kind, the one you never do see. I mean, of course, yourself. That is the next great step in wisdom, to realize that you also are just that sort of person. You also have a fatal flaw in your character. All the hopes and plans of others have again and again shipwrecked on your character, just as your hopes and plans have shipwrecked on theirs. It is no good passing this over with some vague general admission of, such as, of course, I know I have my faults. It is important to realize that there is some really fatal flaw in you, something which gives others the same feeling of despair which their flaws give you. And it is almost certainly something you don't know about, and I love this North Langley, like what the advertisements call halitosis, which everyone notices except the person who has it. Halitosis, bad breath, bad breath. C.S. Lewis is saying it's like bad breath, right? You know, by the way, we've totally forgotten the idea of bad breath with all of our masks. That's been like a bonus of the pandemic, hasn't it? Anyway, uh, you, but bad breath. You don't notice it, but others despair over it. And this is what our conversations are like, Lewis is saying. It's important to realize there is a really fatal flaw in you, something that gives others the same feeling of despair that their flaws give you. So gentle conviction is rooted in humility and humbly recognizes the plank in our own eye. Point number two, to live with a gentle conviction is to practice the art of listening, to practice the art of listening. Now, if you're like me, in a heated discussion, I only think about how to win the argument or my next point, right? The person's lips are moving, you know, and I'm thinking like, ah, what's my next point? What's my next point? And I'm not really listening or hearing the other person. We're no longer listening. Okay, I've got a joke. Did you hear one, the one about the Baptist and what he said to the Anglican? He said, I can't listen to you because of what I think you're about to say. Okay, that's bad. Couldn't help myself, cheesy and painful, but true. Okay, ask yourself this. In a conversation, does does the person you're speaking to have any good ideas? Any at all? If so, could you repeat them? Could you find any common ground? Here's, Here's a helpful tool, and I got this from the Winsome Conviction podcast, which is fantastic. They, they said this. They said, could I articulate the other person's position in such a way that they would nod their head in agreement? If I can't, I'm probably not listening. Or Tim Keller says it this way. He says, when you're talking to someone, make the other person's argument better. I love that. <laughs> when you're talking, you say, okay, I hear you. I totally hear you. Let me tell you what I think I heard. And actually, you have a good point because la da 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 whatever it is, right? It, what does it do? It's not just some gimmick. What it does is it actually forces you to listen and to care, right? To really understand and to work for their good. You place yourself in their shoes and go, okay, yeah, I could see how that's frustrating, or I see how you arrived at that point. You know what I loved? I loved, uh, 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 over a month ago, I was, uh, I was meeting with uh, my counselor, and he 
said something brilliant and something I'd never seen before. But in the story of the prodigal son, some of you know there's a young son, he goes away, he rebels, and he comes home. But the older brother in the story is really angry about it. Well, I had seen how the, how the father goes out into the field and welcomes the older brother and says, come on in, like your younger son is, is alive and we're celebrating. And the older son says no. But then notice how the father listens to the older son just like fly off the handle, right? And in that kind of patriarchal culture, the father never steps in to correct his son. What does he do? He listens. The heart of the father was to listen. And he allows his oldest son to just vent. (laughs) He allows him to vent and he listens to him. And then he reminds him, there's still an amazing party that you're welcome to come to. It's your choice. But he listens to the older son vent. And I thought, yeah, God's a listener. (laughs) He listens to us. And we need to do the same. He listens to our pain. Point number three. To live with a gentle conviction is to avoid tasty shortcuts. Tasty shortcuts. I don't know if this is a great way to put it. I made this up, but let's, let's roll with it. A tasty shortcut, in my mind, in a conversation is to do something that feels good in the moment. Mmm, tasty, right? Tasty moment. But it's an unfair way of getting ahead in a conversation, right? You took a shortcut. You, 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 you're trying to cheat a little bit. Maybe, as we said earlier, it's that gotcha moment. Maybe it's taking a conversation about like politics or vaccines or masks or churches reopening or whatever, and then suddenly making it really personal to the person. Maybe it's raising your voice. Some of us aren't aware of uh, how our voice is raised in a conversation. Maybe it's cutting someone off midway not letting them finish their thought. Maybe it's venting on social media. Uh, Maybe it's making a sarcastic comment. Sarcasm is so easy to do. Tasty shortcuts never end well. A gentle conviction refuses tasty shortcuts and is slow to anger. We're slow to anger. We move slowly. In the Old Testament, God is described as being slow to anger. And, and the Bible project, which many of us love, uh, Tim Mackey says that that phrase, slow to anger, actually in the Hebrew means long of nose. Long of nose, having a long nose, right? And, 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 and in, for the ancient Hebrews, there was this idea that it takes a while for your nose to get hot. Don't you love that? When you're angry, your nose gets hot. I, I, I don't think mine does. But anyway, this is the ancient, uh, <laughs> ancient image of, of being slow to anger. You have a long nose. It takes a long time for your nose to get hot. I love that. So we must be long-nosed disciples. (laughs) Kerry Newhoff, pastor in Ontario, gives some practical advice here. He talks about the emotions he feels, especially online when he reads something. He writes this. He says, when you feel an emotional reaction to something, don't respond for 24 hours. Sleep on it. Pray about it. After 24 hours elapses, something amazing usually happens you get your brain back. (laughs) That's wonderful, wonderful advice. You get your brain back. You now have the greatest opportunity to to walk with a gentle conviction if you just, oh, I'm not going to respond right now. I'm going to be a long-nosed disciple. I'm going to be slow to anger. I don't want to take the tasty shortcut. Dallas Willard, there's a story, uh, John Ortberg, who's a pastor in California, tells about hanging out with Dallas. Dallas was a, 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 a college professor of philosophy. And uh, one time, John Ortberg was going to have lunch with Dallas, and, and Dallas said, why don't you sit in on my class? Well, some freshman, first-year student in university got up and just laid into Dallas Willard. Well, if you know anything about Dallas, he's like a brilliant philosopher. And this first-year student thinks, you know, some 18-year-old thinks he's a genius, and he's just like you know, giving it to Dallas Willard. And, uh, and Dallas Willard uh, finishes the class and just goes, okay, everyone, uh, class now, uh, thank you for your comment, uh, class now is dismissed. And John Orberg later on at lunch was like, Dallas, why didn't you just like put that kid in his place? You could have like destroyed him with your, with, you know, coming back. And, and, and Dallas said to John Orberg, he said, he said, I didn't do that because I'm practicing the discipline of not having to have the last word. Incredible. (laughs) I'm practicing the discipline of not having to have the last word. How many of us could stand to practice that discipline? 
In an angry, anxious, and polarized age, followers of Jesus don't take the tasty shortcut. Now, point number four. My final point. To live with a gentle conviction is to be aware of the limits of social media and to do our best to meet face-to-face. I want to talk a little bit about social media here uh, and about the the need to really meet face-to-face with others. Some of you know the novel, and maybe you had to read it in school, of of, uh, uh, Frankenstein. Um, Victor Frankenstein, the scientist, and his monster. Mary Shelley, 200 years ago, wrote the story of Frankenstein and his monster. And, 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 and Victor Frankenstein creates a monster, some of you know the story, that eventually turns on him with violence. Many today see the story as this cautionary tale. I mean, it's incredible. It was written 200 years ago. It's a, but it's this cautionary tale about technology and the technology that is now turning against us. The technology that we create for good actually becomes a great evil as it turns on us. Many of us watched the film on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. The documentary was a warning about the dangers of social media and how it works and how social media can actually fuel the hatred and can can create echo chambers and can fuel the hostility and the polarization of our age. Social media has algorithms that try to learn your best interests and then it just feeds you these things that you already agree with and it fuels the anger. Social media is not gentle. It is not the gentleness of Jesus. How could you ever be gentle on Twitter? I myself find it incredibly hard to be gentle on email. And I can write as many words as I want on email, but I can't imagine being limited to Twitter's word count. How can you ever be gentle on, in the comment section on Facebook? We try, of course, and, and some, of, some of you, maybe not me, but some of you do a great job uh, trying to be gentle on social media. But I love how uh, John Inazu and Tim Keller say it. They say, social media and other technology significantly reduce our ability to exercise empathy. See, to be gentle is to exercise empathy. And the best way to have empathy is to see your brother, to see your sister, to hear their story, to meet over a coffee. And I get it. It's hard. We're in a pandemic. It's hard to meet face to face. Um, But as best we can, how can we limit our time on social media and actually meet face to face and to hear each other out? David French argues, he says this, he says, if you can't control your emotions on social media, then you need to run from social media the way Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. It's killing your soul. Some of us today need to run (laughs) from social media. Others are able to do it in moderation. And that's good. Where are you at? How can you and I step away from these conversations online and, and even though it's difficult in a COVID-19 world to meet face to face, to see my brother in front of me, to see his eyes <laughs> and to hear from him. He is loved by God. Let me summarize these. Walk in humility, practice the art of listening, avoid tasty shortcuts, and meet face to face. I hope these four things were helpful, but I also want to say I, I had way too much to share today, and, and, uh, and we, we are going to do a little bit more on our After Sunday podcast this week. I'm going to talk a little bit more about gentleness. Feel free to tune into that. I have a little bit more to say about social media there, um, but there was just too much to put in the sermon. But I, I want to end with a final pushback. If you're listening to my four points, you might be asking yourself, Matthew, isn't it time for gentleness to be done? Like, the time for gentleness is over, right? We're at war, you know? Matthew, gentleness may have worked for a while, but we're beyond gentleness now. No, I don't think so. First of all, any good teacher will tell you that to respond harshly is to guarantee somebody won't hear the message. The only way, the only way, the only way your neighbor has a chance of understanding your heart and you have a chance of understanding their heart is when we approach each other with gentle conviction. I think it's the only way. And we're not too far gone. Secondly, I want to say this. Jesus doesn't give you another option. Look around. Read the New Testament. There's not another option. It's the only way. We trust the coach. This is the play call he has made. And we follow him in obedience. Matthew 5. Blessed are the gentle 
for they will inherit the earth. (laughs) See, the kingdom of God has come, and the ways of the old order no longer work. Look around. North Langley, is the old order working? Is it working at all? No, it doesn't work. It's failing. It's a failed system. Welcome to the kingdom of God. And his gentle way is the better way. Would you pray for a gentle heart? As the worship band comes up, I just want to say gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that God is delighted to give you. Ask for it this week. You know, in the Bible, he's the vine, we're the branches. Anything good comes as we abide in him. He is delighted to grow gentleness in us. When we open up our lives to the life of Jesus, he's so delighted to take your life and to make it gentle. Have you opened up your life to Jesus? Listen again one final time to his invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. I want to say to some of you who live stream our services and you're new to Jesus, you don't, you're not yet a Christian, but you're exploring who Jesus is, like you can give your life to him now, today. You can reach out to our prayer team, prayer at nlcc.ca. They would love to pray with you over the phone, maybe, or through Zoom or something like that. They'd love to show you how to give your life to Jesus. But if you're, if you're new to Jesus, would you surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I need you. I want you. I, I'm so done living the way of the old order. I, I want your new life, your kingdom life to pour into my life. I want you to be in control of my life. I'm done trying to control my life. I want you to control my life. I surrender control to you. And and when we do that, he is delighted to give us his life, his salvation. He's delighted to just purify our hearts, to cleanse us of sin, and to welcome us on this beautiful journey of following him. And so you're welcome to do that today. Um, Reach out to any of us on our staff team, to the prayer team. We would love to walk with you in that. As I end, I want to Focus our eyes on 1 Peter 2. Listen to this. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he, this is Jesus, entrusted himself to him who judges justly. North Langley, would you close your eyes as we think about Jesus here, as we end our time? There, as he was being falsely accused and as he was being beaten, and then as he was led to the cross. When he was crucified, they hurled their insults at him, but he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, Jesus bore our sin in his own body on the cross. Right now, in your mind's eye, can you see his arms? They're stretched open wide, totally vulnerable, totally welcoming. And he sheds his own blood for you. And when you look at him in your mind's eye and you see the cross, just remember he is the embodiment of truth. He is the truth. And that is what truth looks like. Totally open and vulnerable and welcoming and self-sacrificial. Do you see him? That's your gentle king. Jesus, you have been so gentle with me. Even in my rebellion, you have been so gentle to me. You are full of truth. All praise and honor and glory to the great shalom maker. By his wounds we've been healed. Oh, great gentle one. Come and heal your people. Amen.